Hi, my name is Carly and I'm an alcoholic. Okay, welcome to all of the newcomers. I hope you hear something in the rooms that keep you coming back and everybody with a little bit of time under your belt. I'm really grateful to be able to trudge this road of recovery with you guys. I don't really love public speaking and being up here, but I learned in early recovery that you can't keep what you don't give away. So I'm here to share my a little bit of experience, strength, and hope. So I grew up right here, right here in Provo, Orem area, uh, born and raised. I'm the middle of three, uh, three girls in my family. My parents were quite loving, but they also had a hard time parenting at times. I have really good memories of them when we were younger. Like I know when, my dad, when we were really young, my dad had car issues and he'd still get us to school. He'd put it on your handlebars of his bike and he'd ride us down to, to, to kinder, I think it was kindergarten or first grade. And they, they just, they always tried, even with, through all of their, their struggles. We grew up pretty much in poverty. We were pretty poor. Um, my mom just told us a funny story about she couldn't afford buying us Goosebump books. So she decided to buy us Goose, they're called Goose Lump books or something <laughs> like that. And like we did not know the difference at the time. And I, that was the first time I heard that was this week. And so that, that's the kind of little things that my parents would do even though we grew up kind of struggling. They, they would still try to be there for us. Yeah, I do sincerely believe that alcoholism is a family disease. The first time I was introduced to addiction was through my parents' addiction. We were pretty young when my parents found drugs and alcohol, and we were put through the ringer through it. I think I was about four or five years old when my parents got pretty heavy into it. They continued to do that for quite some time. It was just another piece of growing up in, in a family with alcoholism that just continued to make my alcoholism grow. And that little outsider part of me continued to be that outsider. We grew up not part of the predominant religion here, and so we were already marked that. Plus, I had addict parents, and so it just continued. And it just started to grow when we were younger. They started getting arrested, and we started seeing a lot of social workers, a lot of cops around. We eventually did get taken away from my parents through addiction. When that happened, the first time it was okay. The worst part about it was us girls got split up, so that was pretty hard on us when we got split up, and we went to different families in my mom's side of the family. Well, they knew that like my mom wouldn't learn her lesson until things got hard, and so they let us go back home. When we went back home, it got really weird. It, it didn't stay for the first time. And so they continued their addiction. And we had very weird people in and out of the house. We always had cops around. And we always, I think I got my complex at a pretty young age, not liking the cops around anymore. The state took us the second time. And we ended up at a foster home. This was super uncomfortable. And I don't know if it was uncomfortable because because we were at a stranger's house or because her house was so clean and so peaceful. And that just was not the way that I grew up. It wasn't that calm and peacefulness that this foster mom took us in. We were really blessed to have such a good one to, to take us in and really just, it was awkward, but it was still, it was decent. This was around the first time I was introduced to 12-step meetings. My mom was trying to get sober, and she continued to go to meetings, and I would go with her, and we were trying to be supportive so we could stay with our parents. It wasn't until my adult life and me going through addiction myself that I really realized that why she would have chose her addiction over us, and that was really confusing as a child. The last time we were taken away, this was about the end of that little portion of it, but the last time we were taken away, we w didn't go to such a good home. And we went to a distant aunt's on my dad's side of the family, and she was willing to take all three of us in. At this time, addiction really, it really messed with me a lot. It, it gave me a lot of social and separation anxiety. 
my hands started to crack and I started wetting the bed as like a nine-year-old. There was a lot of sexual abuse in the house and we started just losing hope in our parents. It was like the third round of getting taken away and it was really hard. It was the first time that we were getting older so we started understanding addiction a little bit more and it was really confusing to us as younger. They did eventually get us back and we were really grateful for that. It was about, I was going into seventh grade when I got to go live with my mom. My parents had to split up to be able to live with them and to get sober. But in the long run, it was a good little split for the, meanwhile, they're back together. When they split up, my mom was heavy into her recovery, which we were so proud of, and, but she did spend a lot of her time at recovery events, and her life was getting bigger, and she was going to school. She was working as a single mom, and we didn't have much of a mom still, and we, had, we got to live at home, which we were grateful for, but I think with having her so busy at the time, it just kind of lit the fire for me to be able to start my addiction. And I was really scared of drugs for a long time. And I mean, I even went through a D.A.R.E. program and I loved D.A.R.E. so much. <laughs> the cop that would come to D.A.R.E., he was my favorite and it was the first cop I really liked. And it was awkward though. I, we were, I was about 13, I had to go to a new school. It was so uncomfortable. And I didn't really have that guidance that I needed. At 13, I think my first figure out is I found out that boys would give you that attention. I found out that even though I wasn't getting it from my mom and dad, that like other people were interested in me. And it, it just didn't matter who it was as long as they were giving me that attention. I remember I was like 13 years old. I was telling people that I was like 16 or 18, depending on how old they were. And I was out and about. I was doing my own thing, and I think I started really being a little less scared and realizing I knew a little bit more about alcohol than most people did. I'm sure I had a few drinks growing up. I don't remember my first taste of alcohol, but I do remember my first blackout. And I was with some older guys, and I remember them asking me if I've ever drank, and I didn't even blink. I was like, yep, Jack's my favorite. <laughs> and I had no idea. I never drank that much. I maybe had a sip or two. And we waited 30 minutes, and his friend brought us back some Jack and Coke. And I just remember we each had a liter. We poured out the top, and we poured in as much as we could. And... That's all I remember of that night. <laughs> I don't really remember much after that. I remember waking up and my bottle was gone and I was like kind of proud that I drank it all. And there it was, I triggered my alcoholism allergy. Since that drunk, I chased that oblivion. I chased it from, to, hell and back, back, to hell and back. And like I said, I was really scared of drugs and so I really tried to steer clear of drugs and I didn't know I could go to such steps with alcohol. So I avoided a lot of drugs for a long time. I finally found my best friend and her mom was an alcoholic and her brother was a weed dealer and I was at home. It was my <laughs> second home. <laughs> I got a job really young, I was 14 years old and I decided to start working because I needed my own money if I wanted cute clothes and if I wanted a cell phone. So I start working and I found out that I could bribe my friend's mom to buy a half a gallon of Bartons for 14 bucks so it was cheap and she'd fill up her big gulp, the bottom of her big gulp cup and she'd give us the rest and ha we'd, we'd, we were like 14 years old. And it just continued like that. Those, those were the kind of things that I was up to as a kid. I, I, I didn't know any better. My childhood was taken really early and I started to thrive in it. And that's when I really started to learn how to lie and to manipulate. I really got into the habits of finding out who could get me what and I ran with it. I started fighting with my parents a lot at this time. I was bringing alcohol, drugs, I even brought firearms into the house before, boys, and 
I was bringing all kinds of things in, and I was probably, I was like, I had a trucker mouth, and I was fully smoking cigarettes at 16. My, my newly recovered mom and dad had no idea what to do with me. Uh, they were, and, and t- I, I remember two huge fights I had with them about it. And the one I was mouthing off to my dad and I, I was bringing up their past because I, you know, it was their fault. It wasn't my fault I found alcohol, it was their fault. And I was a lot harsher than that, obviously, and I, he slapped me across the face. And I was, like, mortified, like, how dare he do that to me? And then a couple months later, I got into a big fight with my mom And she told me, I I was dropping out of school, and I was missing for days on end, just causing so much worry in their lives. And we, we we were always in a screaming match, whatever it's about. And she yelled at me. She told me, you know what? You have no damn integrity. And I looked at her, and I realized I didn't even know what the word integrity meant. (laughs) And I had to realize that, like, you know, and obviously at the time, I just fought back. I didn't care what she had to say. I'll just go drink about it because you don't know. I know better. You're an addict. I'm not. I just like to party. <laughs> and I, I was just a very wild teenager. I, was a, I didn't care about anyone. I was listening to somebody in a meeting the other day, and she was trying to think back in her head about what she thought of when she was in these situations. And the only thing I thought of was me. Like, I have no idea what was going on while I was doing any of this. I have no idea where my family was, if they were doing okay. I look back and I can tell you basic facts, but I can't really tell you what was going on. I ran with it. I liked the oblivion and I liked alcohol. It took me... I don't know. I was... I used to think I was fun during this time. (laughs) So these were my fun years is what I'd call them. (laughs) And uh, I I was a free spirit, and I just wanted to try what you were trying. And I went and experimented with a little mother outside sources, and I didn't think anything wrong of it because I was like, as long as I don't do the heavy stuff that my parents did, I'll be just fine it will be fine. I just like to drink my whole extended family drinks. Like, it's just normal. It's what you do when you grow up, and I thought I was grown up. A lot of it's a blur, to be honest. I don't remember a lot of conversations I had, a lot of those fights I talk about. Like, I remember fighting, but I'm pretty sure it was just about me lying. I am just being disrespectful. I hit about 20 years old, and I found the first love of my life, Jose Cuervo. (laughs) And I was so happy about it. Like, I just, it was the drunk I was looking for, and I didn't know that's what I was looking for my whole life. (laughs) I found a friend who introduced me to it, and it was her favorite alcoholic beverage as well. And we just thrived off of each other in the chaos. Misery loves company and we continued to just bounce off each other and we'd invite the weird guys over and we'd invite like other chicks who like to drink and we always had these like understandings that like you know we blame it on the alcohol so no matter what we did to each other we'd forgive as long as we could drink again just a lot of alcohol I ended up dating her brother because that was easiest and he didn't judge me because his sister was just as bad. And I dated him for a little bit and I drug him through the dirt. I latched on to something that was safe and I let him pay for my housing and I let him buy my alcohol and until I run us through the dirt. Like we were behind in bills, and he had to literally sit me down and show me. He's like, Carly, after our budget with everything that you buy and all the alcohol and on chasers and everything, you have $17 to your name this month. That was the first realization where I was like, oh, well, maybe I should slow down. Like may- maybe I don't have the money. And then I got my obsession. And I was like, no, he's just an asshole, and I'm going to do what I want with my money. 
uh, and his. I ran that into the dirt, of course, and I just fight after fight. He'd beg me to stop blacking out and driving, and he'd beg me to come home, and I just didn't care. That's not what I wanted to do, and that's not what I was going to do. Shortly after that, I ended up, well, we were breaking up, and it was my first time I was on a lease with a man, and so I had to do it kind of responsibly, but I didn't know how to do that. So not a big bar person. I drink too much, and I'm too sad of a drunk to go to the bar usually. <laughs> and so I'd end up, uh, I, I ended up going to a bar. A friend invited me, and I met my future ex-husband. And who better to help me move out of my current apartment? <laughs> and so I tried to tell him, I, and that's just me excusing myself, I tried to tell him we were going to move, and it just didn't matter. I just, I could not bear to sit with myself for long enough to do, to finish one thing and start a new thing. I, I continuously sat there and covered up my feelings with who, what, where, anything that would give me any kind of buzz. Um, it, it really turned me into a dark person. Um, I, in this time, I lost all my friends. I would just go from friendship group to friendship group because I just burned my bridges. Everyone thought it was fun at first until Carly got too drunk at the party. And it wasn't once or twice, but it was multiple times. And people stopped inviting me around. A lot of people stopped inviting me around. And... I met this guy, and he liked how much I could drink. And I was so excited because I was like, oh, he's not going to judge me. Like, I'm not an alcoholic. I just like to drink. And I, <laughs> my dad always told me, you're a drunk, not an alcoholic. You don't go to meetings. <laughs> and I was proud of that. I, I was totally cool with that. I, I was a drunk, and at least I didn't do drugs. <laughs> like, that's what I thought. And that wasn't true. And because I just couldn't be honest with myself. <laughs> so I was always, like, greater than with my misery. I, I, I was never just understanding of just where I was at. We partied pretty hard. I found my fellow alcoholic husband, and we didn't know how to do anything without alcohol. We would disc golf with alcohol. I was just telling Tim I would go to movies all the time, and we'd bring a, a pint of Everclear because that, I know, I don't know. I wasn't very picky. And we would pour it into our drinks. I told him, I don't think I remember a damn movie I went to. <laughs> like, I, it was just a nice nap. They had comfy chairs, or that was the new start of the comfy chairs. <laughs> we drank ourselves into the dirt, and it just... It just kind of got a little possessive, and it got really weird, and he'd start getting worried if I got blacked out without him, and I was worried if he was drinking without me, and we started kind of getting weird to each other. We ended up breaking up, and I hit a really big bottom then. I just went through two long-term relationships and didn't feel anything for any of them, and I hit a really big bottom at that time. And, of course, I just download a dating app and find some guy that sells other substances. That was always my solution, is who's willing to accept me as I am. And I didn't even know who I was besides that drunk. I ended up getting really, really depressed in those three months. And I did find outside sources, and I decided I was scared of them. I, I, I didn't want to go down that because that was, that was the one standard I had. And I ended up hanging out with an ex, and my future ex-husband decides to slash his tires. So I decide to get back with him and to secure our relationship. We get married. Because that's the logical thing to do. I was going to show him that I was going to be faithful to him, and he could trust me. We kind of rushed into the marriage. We ended up taking over my family's vacation, because that's what I do. And I decided to make it a destination wedding, because that's the next exciting thing for me. And I do not remember that wedding. <laughs> 
It took me two tries to get a marriage license because the first time she turned me away for being too intoxicated <laughs> to sign a legal document. And the second time I was, I, I vaguely remember signing and then we went and got married and I have pictures to prove it. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I want to get in the ocean for some of the pictures. And so we go get in the ocean and I'm obviously intoxicated and I lose my wedding ring. <laughs> and so um, Maui's ocean has a wedding ring. <laughs> and now I can joke about it and tell him like, it knew my marriage was doomed for the start. <laughs> as soon as we got back from that Hawaii trip, he showed me how possessive he actually was. He decided that I was his property, and he decided that I was unfaithful. And I was not, if that counts. <laughs> but uh, I, I couldn't get him to believe it. He was so far into his, and I was so far into mine that it just it didn't matter. We just would fight over one, one thing. I, I was a little late. I, I got a text from the wrong person. We wanted different things. We, we just would fight. I remember we'd have to buy two different fifths so we wouldn't fight over them <laughs> nightly. <laughs> I remember we were both so hung up in ourselves in our own drama that we, I would pour an extra shot and hide it in the cupboard because just in case he drank the rest of my bottle, I'd have some. And I just, I, th those were the things that were on my mind. That, that's what consumed my life. I'm sure I had a job and other things a little bit going on, but that, that was my life. Things got really dark there. I started accepting a lot of physical abuse. I started accepting getting thrown through doors. Every door in that apartment was broken. I got really, it got really dark where like, I used to like, when my parents would have a hard time, I'd hide in the bathroom. Well, if I hide in the bathroom, he would knock the door down, and porcelain hurts a lot more than your bed. So you learn how to cope with it. You learn how to be a part of instead of, because I, I didn't have anything else at the time. It took him, we were out on our balcony, and we were drinking and playing cards, and he got mad at me over who knows what, and he ended up taking my yoga ball and hitting, with, hitting me against it so hard that my head hit the railing and it was the first time I realized that like, oh my God, he's dangerous. And I just remember bleeding all over and I just had so much blood on me. I just, it was just that when you're drunk and you have those moments back to reality that you realize what's going on it was like I've been in a blackout for years and I realized, oh my God, what am I doing? Like, and I don't think he was gonna stop. By whatever God there is, the neighbor was out there walking his dog and witnessed it. And he yelled up at that balcony and he yelled and obviously the ex had so much to say back to him that he didn't notice me running back in and I just ran to that neighbor. And I think that neighbor saved my life that day. That neighbor ended up taking me into his home and calling the police and I have family that work for the county. So I knew it was gonna get back to my whole parents and family that I've been lying to for months, not that they didn't know. And I ended up, uh, I drove myself to the hospital because I'm stubborn. I told them that my mom was going to drive me and then they made me Uber home because they realized I was intoxicated. But they stapled me up and, and as dysfunctional as my family is, like I said, they're so loving. And the next day they moved me out of that apartment. They didn't quite know how to help me right off the bat. They didn't know, they were angry and I was just sad. I was really sad, and I don't think I was just sad about him, but I think I was sad about a lot of things that I just haven't dealt with yet. And, ooh. And I, obviously I drank, because that's what I thought I needed to do, and the victim's advocate ended up giving me a therapist. I tried therapy, because I thought, okay, maybe that would help. I didn't think it was for my drinking. I thought it was for the abuse. 
And I get there, and she's trying to tell me to go to AA. And I'm like, are you serious? That's his problem, not mine. And I, she kept like bringing out these charts of emotions to me. And I was like, this lady's crazy. She thinks I'm a child. And I, so I went to a couple, I, I'd drink a little and then show up at the palace because why not? <laughs> it was the only way I had the courage to. And I showed up at the palace a few times and obviously I wouldn't talk to anybody, but I showed up and some of the old timers there would get me to share every once in a while and I didn't quite hear it then, but it took a couple months for me to tell, I obviously did not like that therapist anymore. And I, I got to the point where I was pissed drunk at living in a hotel with three cats and I was having, I don't know, hallucinations of the cleaning ladies trying to steal my cats. <laughs> and I was tripping on it. I was, I, I, <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. And like, like I, people were telling me, you know, like, maybe you need help. And I, it was the first times my actual, like, the people in my life were telling me that and the people who usually accept me the way I was. And I, it took me a couple tries and a small phone, it was a FaceTime intervention, <laughs> but I finally was like, I'll go to detox, but I'm, I don't need rehab, I just need to start over. That was my best choice I've ever made. I went to that detox, and AA always talks about the clergyman, and I didn't really know what that was, but it's the only way I can describe the guy that came and talked to me. And three days later after detox, I woke up, and I don't remember most of it, but I woke up, and some clergyman came and talked to me, and he basically was the first person to tell me how it was, told me, you have nothing, why don't you try rehab? Your insurance will pay for it. So I was like, fine, <laughs> like, okay. And I went to a pretty nice rehab, actually, up in Salt Lake. And I, uh, I, they offered multiple different options. They weren't just a 12-step rehab. And I tried anything I could to avoid the God thing. I did not want AA. I was like, my mom's still messed up, and that didn't work for her. <laughs> and so I, uh, I just had prejudgment all over it where I tried the other programs as hard as I could. And I got out. I did an outpatient, and then I got lonely. I was a couple months in, and my outpatient, luckily, there was a woman working the reception desk downstairs that went to Alcoholics Anonymous, and he gave me her number, and she took me to the biggest women's meeting. It was so scary, but, but she helped me, I think, get a book. I don't know if I had them or not before, but she helped me open the book, and she helped me start reading and to start getting honest. I was pretty desperate at this time, and I was willing to give her whatever she wanted to the point where on my four steps, she was top of it. <laughs> and um, I was willing, though, and I read it to her. <laughs> and uh, I was... <laughs> It took until about six months sober until I told everyone, you know, I got this. I don't need AA. I'm sober. I have six months, and I have a boyfriend. I'm back at school, or I'm at school for the first time. Somehow in my addiction, I got my GED, so that was impressive. I signed up for college. Volk Rehab helped me. Folk Rehab helped me with that, getting into school, and that really helped, and I just had that kick start. Like I I'd never picked up my six-month chip, and it took exactly six more months for me to want to kill myself. Yeah. I, my boyfriend relapsed. I had to move back into my mom's house. My sister was going crazy through postpartum. 
I lost my job, I flunked out of school, and I didn't understand because I didn't take a drop of alcohol for six or for a year. I just was baffled that my life could be at this place. I was like, obviously that program doesn't work. And something by the gift of God or a higher power, whatever it is, the universe, I decided to go pick up my one year chip by myself. And the only meeting that was available was a women's meeting on Friday nights. And I showed up and I was terrified. And it was the first time that I could see the promises happening. I heard them when they read them in the room and I watched the women reading them and I think they were honest, like it, they were authentic. And I wanted that. And I realized that second half of the first step that my life is unmanageable and I was taught with or without alcohol. My life was unmanageable and I wanted what they had. And I got my second sponsor that I worked with and she, I was, I chose her because she was pretty and she liked to fish and I do too. <laughs> And we even had shared the same favorite fishing hole. I thought that was a God thing. <laughs> I, uh, I, I did anything she asked me to do. She was a pretty hardcore sponsor, and I had strict rules. And I've never had rules in my life. <laughs> I didn't care. I felt like, well, okay, well, that structure's what I need. Like, let's do it. And I was desperate enough at one year sober to finally try the program. She took me through all 12 steps and she helped me learn how to be a sponsor. She guided me. Everyone talks about like which step they really found their higher power in and mine was step three. It was the first time that I realized that I could let go and let God and that was the most relieving moment of my life. That it just wasn't on me anymore. I love step three still. It gets me emotional because I just, I'm so happy that I found that power in myself to be able to have a higher power guide me and to even help me do intimidating things like this. I was able to complete my steps with her and I still needed to grow. I realized that she liked her program small and simple and that to each their own. But I needed something more. I needed more people in my life. I was willing to rely on her but wasn't willing to rely on any other woman in the program. For various reasons, COVID happened and we ended up doing a bunch of Zoom meetings and I got lonely because all I knew were boys and boys just were not sufficing. They weren't. I, I tried to find my God in there, and I just, it wasn't happening. What I did find is I found a sponsor who's sponsored by a sponsor and who sponsors many women, and she brought me a huge group of sobriety sisters that I am so grateful for. Um, she, in this time, she helped me walk through my first healthy relationship, and she helped me walk through all of those stages. She was there when I didn't know what to do or when I wanted to repeat all my old habits. I was able to call her and text her and she taught me. She taught me how to be a woman in recovery. She helped me find my courage in my own voice and she definitely did. She brought people, authentic people into my life. Today, I have a higher power of my own understanding and sometimes it's the magic and the mundane. Like it's, she's helping me work on figuring out that in the day-to-day -day steps, just a day at a time and life's on life's terms. She helps me understand how to sponsor when my sponsee's problems are different than mine. And I'm not afraid today to be able to tell them I don't know anymore. I used to be so embarrassed because I didn't know. I had like a 10th grade education. I didn't know shit. And today I'm proud to say I don't know. And I am grateful that I have that kind of peace today with myself. 
I have a big life today. One of my favorite things I do is sober softball, and that includes our it includes AA and then multiple other different kinds of recovery programs. And it's brought me a whole second family in recovery and it's helped me be very tolerant. AA's code is love and tolerance and I know how to be tolerant towards other people and their version of the program today. And even my parents and when they struggle, I know that tolerance today due to the 12 steps and the, even the traditions and the concepts. There's three of them, and they're all very worthy of working. I went to a sober softball tournament, and I and it helps me travel. I got to go to Florida because of recovery. I got to go to Arizona and Nevada. And I went to a tournament, and we had this big recovery meeting. And one of the things I loved that one of the guys said was, our disease d dies at the light of exposure. And that's just stuck with me since. And it's reminded me to stay current and to stay honest with Alcoholics Anonymous. Today, I don't have to hold in any of those secrets. I don't have to have a, an authority complex. I don't have to sit here and be the bravest one in the room or, or even the one that doesn't belong. Today, I, I get to be honest about where I'm at no matter what that looks like does not mean my life is perfect today because it is life on life's terms and I just get to walk through it with a little more peace and serenity today. I don't know. I'm, you know, the only other thing I can talk about is the service in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's something. And one of the things that I've always learned and thanks to the, the old timers that have been around me is when I'm uncomfortable or when I'm all self-consumed, when I'm just so busy in my head that's AA service and service outside of AA, it works. The big book talks about it. If I'm having relationship issues, to go to service. And there's all kinds of different service out there, whether it's like the AA Christmas parties, if it's helping with these meeting houses, if it's helping your mom in the garden, like all of those little pieces of my recovery today, it continues to give me that integrity now that I know what that word means. Recovery has taught me, and I'm grateful for that. Today I am a woman with integrity and grace, and I'm, I get to finally be proud of who I am and where I come from because we do not shut the door on our past. I don't need to and I don't wish to because it made me who I am today. But once again, just welcome to the newcomers because you are the most important people in the room. Don't leave before the miracle happens. I didn't, it took a year and it still happened for me. That's all I got, thanks guys.